Yat A, my relatives, good morning. It is uh, Sunday morning, January 30th, and I'm sitting down to drink my second cup of coffee. And I want to talk about the fact that yesterday was the 159th anniversary of the Bear River Massacre. And I want to uh, take some time to lament and remember and just talk more in depth about that piece of our nation's history. But before I begin, as I always do, please allow me to acknowledge the people whose land I'm on. So uh, I am living in what's now known as Washington, D.C., and these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And I want to honor the Piscataway as the host people of these lands. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. I know it may seem like I say these words and they sound kind of rote and they, I, I just repeat them over and over um, every time I come on, but I do this for a very good reason. And the reason I do this is because there is a history to these lands. There is a history and a, a stories in these lands that we don't know about. And the people, the indigenous nations who are living on these lands long before Columbus got lost at sea have a story that needs to be told. And the story needs to be honored and that, that needs to be respected. And so when I do a land acknowledgement, I'm remembering that there is a history to these lands that I don't know. It's not, it's not put into the forefront of our history books. And it's a reminder, we always need to be looking deeper. We always need to be going in um, more in depth into the, our nation's history. And I want to start this morning, and I, I want to thank the people who are on. I see uh, Phil Fox is on and Patty Shield is on. And uh, there's, a, there's many others. There's uh, several other people who are on. And I want to thank you for joining me this morning as we talk about the Bear River Massacre. I'm going to share with you a story right here, um, and it was about a year ago. I don't even remember the exact date, but it was about a year ago. I was after the campaign had ended, and I was, for whatever reason, I was Googling Indian massacres, and I was, I was trying to, I don't know if I was looking for information on a specific one or if I was just looking to see what else was out there, but I was Googling Indian massacres. And I came across a massacre called the Bear River Massacre, which I had never heard of before. If you've heard me speak and you, you've heard me give my presentations and my lectures, you've seen some of these slides I'm going to share, right? You've seen me show this slide, which has a history of our nation's wars against indigenous peoples. And we have a list of many of the prominent massacres that I was able to find. And I put them on here. And when I even look through this list, the Bear River Massacre isn't on this. I created this list maybe five or six years ago. When I go through native history in our in my lectures and I talk about Removal Act and the Dakota 38 and the Sand Creek Massacre, boarding schools and Wounded Knee, I, I haven't talked about the massacre at Bear River. And even when I talk about the 425 medals of honor that were given to U.S. soldiers. And I look through the list, and this list is chronological. And if you look at the top of this list, it's in the, the early 1800s and the mid-1800s. And you'll see that the Bear River Massacre isn't listed on here either. But it was, again, about a year ago that I was doing some research and I came across this article in the Smithsonian Magazine. And I'm going to read the first few paragraphs of this article for you. The title is called The Search is On for the Site of the Worst Indian Massacre in U.S. History. And it says, on the frigid dawn of January 29, 1863, Seguich, a leader among the Shoshone of Baya Ogji, or Big River, in what is now Idaho, stepped outside his lodge and saw a curious bend of fog moving down the bluff towards him across a half-frozen river. The mist was no fog, though. It was steam rising from the sub -zero air, in the sub-zero air from hundreds of U.S. Army foot soldiers, cavalry, and their horses. The army was coming for his people. 
Over the next four hours, the 200 soldiers under Colonel Patrick Connor's command killed at least 250 or more Shoshone, including at least 90 women, children, and infants. The Shoshone were shot, stabbed, and battered to death. Some were driven into the icy river to drown or freeze. And it goes on to say in this article that some of many historians refer to the Bear River Massacre as the worst Indian massacre in U.S. history. Some estimates are that as high as 400 Shoshone were brutally murdered, slaughtered. In the accounts I've been able to read and find and listen to, the, the details of this massacre are absolutely brutal. I want to share this. Um, this is a podcast. Or first, I'm going to share a TED Talk. And I found this actually this morning as I was doing some more research into this. And this is a, a TED Talk by Darren Perry, who is, um, his Twitter handle is, Nate, is Shoshone Elder. And he's ran for tribal office. He's served in tribal office and he's ran for public office within, within the state of Utah. And he has written and spoken extensively about the Bear River Massacre. And I found this um, TEDx talk that he gave. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been well hi highly publicized. It doesn't have a lot of views. But I encourage you to listen to it as he talks about from his own perspective, from his own mouth the perspective of the Shoshone people, what happened at the Bear River Massacre. I also found a podcast that he was on. And uh, this is an hour-long podcast. I, again, found this. I, I just found the works of Darren Perry uh, today as I was preparing for this. I'd done other research on the Bear River Massacre. I hadn't come across Darren Perry before. Um, but uh, here I found a podcast that he was on. It's called Speak Your Peace Podcast, and he goes into depth about um, the Bear River Massacre and a book he wrote on the Bear River Massacre as well. And I encourage you to listen around the 27-minute and 40-second mark where he begins giving an account of the massacre. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you to listen to, again, in his own words, the words of a Shoshone elder, what happened at Bear River. Um, yesterday on my on my uh, social media, you know, I also shared two other stories. I'm going to put these stories in here. One of them was from a public radio station in Utah um, called KUER, and uh, it's an NPR station, and they give um, the story of the massacre. And then there was a story, and that 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 story is about three or four years old, I think. But then recently there was another story uh, that came out this year on KTVB, which is a channel, a news station in Idaho. And they did a story on, again, the Bear River Massacre. And I appreciated both of those because they were hard to listen to because, and I, I need to warn you that, and actually before the first one on, on the NPR uh, station, there's a kind of a warning that some of the descriptions are graphic. Um, but they were very honest, and they talk about clearly how history is written by the victors, and therefore our nation doesn't know the story of Bear River, and it's an important story that we need to know. And so, yeah, I, I debated going online yesterday if I was going to talk uh, either over a second cup of coffee or just doing something about Bear River, but I recognize that I needed a day just to kind of let my my thoughts kind of settle, right? For me, the Bear River Massacre is still a piece of history I'm just learning about. I, I have not studied it extensively. I haven't read extensively about it. I've been piecing more of it together through, again, these podcasts, through articles I've written, through stories I've watched, um, or articles I've read and through stories I've watched. Um, but I'm still kind of piecing th it together. And this massacre sounds absolutely brutal. Um, and the accounts I've heard are literally gut-wrenching. And so I'm still kind of in a space of lament before I can really um, go into depth about all of this and, and, and what, yeah, 
so that's why I didn't say anything yesterday. I did post some stuff on my social media, but I'm still deeply kind of wrestling with this history and, and coming to grips with it and uh, learning how to talk about it a bit more extensively, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this today. But uh, I especially want to encourage you to listen to those stories by, um, by uh, Darren Perry, again, because he is Shoshone, and he has served as a leader for his people. And it's important that we hear these stories from the perspective of the people themselves. And so I encourage you to listen to those stories. I also, um, he actually wrote a book as well. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll put this up onto my, uh, into the comment section as well. Um, the only place I could find it was on Amazon. It came out actually about the same time my book on selling truths came out. The book I co-authored with Sing Chan Ra came out in November of 2019, which is when our book came out. Um, but uh, and there's actually there's a lot of people who are talking about the fact that they've never heard of Bear River before. They've never heard of the Bear River Massacre. It has not been widely talked about. Well, Wounded Knee and others have been much more uh, discussed. Bear River has just begun to enter kind of the, the public space and the public discourse in the past few years. Um, in fact, in the in the podcast that uh, that was put up there um, by Darren Perry. He addressed the question of why does he think most people haven't heard of this massacre yet? Um, so anyway, I just, I wanted to share this with you and I wanted to make sure that you understand where this massacre fits in the context of our nation. Um, because yesterday was the 159th anniversary of this. So this anniversary took place on January 29, 1863. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that this is during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. And the challenge that we face as a nation is that we've never lost a war that matters. History is almost always written by the victors. And because the U.S. has never lost a war that matters, we've always written our own history. White landowning men have written their own account of the history of this country, which has allowed them to essentially create a mythology. And most of what we study in our history books is so either out of context or so deeply biased that we don't even understand our history and we only understand our mythology. And Abraham Lincoln is one of those mythological figures we have where we hold him up as this hero, a man who literally saved our nation, a ball of slavery, and helped us reckon with our racial injustices of the past. But that's not his story at all, right? I'll, I'll talk about this more later in February during my uh, during uh, Black History Month and talk more in depth about Abraham Lincoln, but he was a blatant white supremacist. And not only was he a blatant white supremacist who had no value for black lives, but he was a blatant white supremacist who was actually one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. In 1862 and 1864, he signed a series of bills. First was the Homestead Act and the second was the Pacific Railway Act. These were acts that were drafted by Congress, signed by Abraham Lincoln and in an effort to help this nation complete manifest destiny. The Homestead Act allocated 160 acres to any family willing to go west and homestead for five years, and the Pacific Railway Act allocated the land and the resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. The Transcontinental Railway at that point in 1862 had reached into Omaha, Nebraska, which is about in the middle of this map. And uh, the nation was, again, trying desperately hard to get to the Pacific Coast, and they had three really primary routes going across the country. 
this first route went from was at Omaha, Nebraska, trying to get to San Francisco. I had to go through Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and Nevada and California. There was a northern route going from Duluth, Minnesota, into North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and coming out near Seattle. And then there was a southern route going through uh, the territory of New Mexico, the territory of Arizona, and coming out near the port of Los Angeles. And these were the three primary routes. And with in two and a half years of signing the first round of these bills, right after the removal of the Dakota and the Winnebago, the hanging of the Dakota 38, the negating of the treaties in Minnesota, which took place right here where the arrow is pointing, after the Sand Creek Massacre, which happened in 1864, and removed the Cheyenne and Arapaho from the state of Colorado. After the long walk of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache, which removed our nations from the territory of New Mexico and Arizona and brought us down to Bosque Redondo. And then after, of course, the Bear River Massacre, which as you can see, took place right along the route of where that railroad had to go to get over the mountains and through over to Nevada and out near San Francisco. So Abraham Lincoln was literally, literally ethnically cleansing the Southwest, or the, the West, to make way for the trans Railway to complete manifest destiny. That's what he was doing. He was one of the most not only an unapologetic, blatant white supremacist, but he was one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. And the fact that we have a memorial to him, modeled after a temple, and the grandest memorial on the entire National Mall is a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. The man was vile. One reason I think we don't know about the Bear River Massacre is because it does not fit well with our mythological understanding of Abraham Lincoln. And so these are the things we have to wrestle with. These are the things that we have to learn how to talk about and acknowledge as a nation. This is where we have to create this common memory we need this national dialogue on race, gender, and class. We need to find a way to talk about these things. Not so we can shame people, not so we can abuse people, mistreat people, but so that we can build a better community, find a way to move forward in a healthier way so that we can actually participate in racial conciliation truth and conciliation. These are the things we have to do. And this is, we, and, but we can't do that and maintain our colonial white supremacist heroes, right? People love to say, well, we're taking down statues of General Lee and, and we're, we're, we're taking down the, the monuments to the Confederates. That's all well and good, right? But that's easy. That's the low-hanging fruit, right? Our nation doesn't like losers. The Confederates lost the war. It's easy to take down the monuments, or much easier to take down those monuments. But the bigger problem, it's not the white men who lost, right? It's the ones that won. It's Abraham Lincoln. We have to, if we really want to address systemic racism and white supremacy, we have to deal with why in the world we honor this vile man known as Abraham Lincoln, who literally was committing genocide across this nation to complete manifest destiny. You've also heard me talk a lot about how 
this wasn't just purely a political or militarily motivated endeavor. This was a this was religious, right? This was a manifest destiny. This was a belief in promised lands. And you've seen some of the quotes that I've given. You've heard me talk about how our nation justifies its history by claiming the rights to promised lands. And what's fascinating, if you go back and listen to the podcast at Heritage and Arts with Darren Perry. Now, Darren, right, the Shoshone were met first with the Mormons. And it was actually the complaints of the Mormon people that was the, one of the things that spurred the military to come in and to, and to begin to clear out the native peoples because of the conflicts that were happening and the fact that the Mormons felt like the natives weren't giving them enough access to their land. And in the 33 minute and 50 second mark of that podcast, um, Darren gives a quote by a man he identifies as a bishop within the Mormon church. His name is Henry Ballard. And he, the quote says, quote, the quote from Henry is that the massacre was an intervention from our Heavenly Father. Right? This was our Heavenly Father clearing these savage natives out of our lands so that we as white people could live here, could flourish here, could thrive here. Again, just like the Quakers, the Mormons have this reputation of, well, they have a better history with native peoples. And maybe they do in some instances, but they still absolutely looked on us as savages saw us as a challenge or an impediment to their manifest destiny and believed that it was their God-given right to ethnically cleanse us so that they could have their promised lands. And so, again, this is, this is the history that we need to learn how to grapple with. And these are the things that we need to we need to find a way to wrestle through. Again, the purpose of talking about this history is not to shame, it's not to condemn, but it's to say this is our common memory, this is our history, this is what we've done, and this is what we're standing on. And instead of looking back and clinging to this myth of American exceptionalism, which is based on the lie of white supremacy, let's be honest about who we are and what we've done. Let's acknowledge it. Let's work to make it right. Let's bring conciliation into these relationships for the very first time so we can find a way to move forward. And that's the work that I'm doing. This is why I'm here with you today. This is the conversation I'm trying to address and I'm trying to bring in. And I want to thank everyone who's joining this conversation. I want to, uh, I see, uh, Pretty Shield is here commenting throughout. Julie Mendoza, thank you for your comments here. I'm kind of scrolling through. Uh, Shuli Rayberg um, is on here. I appreciate everyone who's kind of chiming in on the comments and, and letting their voice be heard. Adam, thanks for being a part of this today. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for joining me this morning. I want to encourage you to uh, listen to some of these resources that I put into the comments of this live stream. I encourage you to listen to these podcasts, to read some of these books. I'm actually still in the midst of digesting a lot of this myself, which is why I, I'm not talking as in-depth as I probably want to at the moment. But uh, there's a lot we have to learn here, and especially this massacre has been largely hidden from the public view and it has not been a part of the national discourse and most indian massacres are not a central part but they've been a part people are aware of wounded knee people are aware of of the long walk they're aware of the trail of tears but literally bear river which is identified by historians as the worst 
Indian massacre. And when I read the accounts of it, I have to agree. The brutality of these U.S. soldiers is gut-wrenching. Absolutely gut-wrenching. And this is not a part of our national discourse. We have to change that. So I want to thank you, my relatives, for joining me today. Um, I will share again, if you are interested um, in, in the book. I actually had this thought today because, again, if you've read my book, you'll know that, um, that I, I talk about this history. We deconstruct Abraham Lincoln. We talk about the Doctrine of Discovery, but Bear River Massacre is not actually mentioned in our book. And I actually want to speak with my editors. Um, on my publishing company and our, with Ivy Press and Singchon and see is there any way we can add even just a paragraph into our book for future reprintings that might be able to include the, the Shoshone and the Bear River Massacre um, because it's very, very an important part of this nation, of our nation's history. So if you'd like to get a signed, I haven't done that yet, but if you'd like to get a signed copy of, of our book, um, you can get it there at um, on my website. And um, if you're interested in, uh, in joining me and supporting my work on Patreon, I'm also going to share a link here where... Um, and it might be better to start, um, if you're going to join to support on Patreon, you can join today. Uh, they have a, a different billing system where if they will charge you immediately when you sign up, and then they'll charge you again at the beginning of the next month. So it goes on a monthly basis. Um, I just had a, a conversation on there the other day with Sung Chan Ra on my Patreon site. I did a Q&A a couple days ago on there. So those resources are up there. And if you'd like to get immediate access into those, uh, you can you can join us on Patreon uh, by subscribing today. If you want to wait until February 1st, and then you'll get the archives of the stuff we did this month, as well as the new stuff we're going to be doing next month. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in, in supporting what I'm trying to do, uh, I welcome you to join us on Patreon there. But uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been um, a more humbling uh time, at least for me. And uh, I appreciate all of your comments. And I look forward to having more dialogue about this and other things this next week over my second cups of coffee. So I can't have my relatives walk in beauty and maybe learn how to walk in beauty together. Hakonet.